Good evening, everyone. İyi akşamlar and buenasera, I should say. <gülüyor> Welcome to Archaeopolitics Talks. Herkes arkeopatik toplantılarına hoş gelmiş. Ben iki dilli başlayacağım. Today we have yet another special guest. Bugün çok özel bir konumuz daha var. Profesör Doktor Marcella Frangipane. She is a professor of archaeology at the Sapienza University of Rome. Kendisi Sapienza Üniversitesi'nde Roma'dan arkeoloji profesörü Marcella Frangipane Hoca. She was the head of excavations in Malatya Arslantepe between 1990 and 2019, where she had been working since 1976, actually. Uh, 1990-2019 arasında Malatya Arslantepe kazılarını yönetti Marcella Hoca. Herkes oradan yakından tanıyor. Ve aslında 76'dan beri de bu kazıların bir şekilde içinde olduğunu biliyoruz. Dolayısıyla neredeyse 50 yılını Malatya ve bölgedeki kazılarla ilgili bilgilerle doldurmuş durumda. Professor Frangipane is an archaeologist who also has important studies on the theory of state formation process, mostly based on the data she obtained from Aslantepe. Aslantepe'den elde ettiği ve bölgeden elde ettiği verilerle işin teorisine de çok çalışan bir hocamız. Devletleşme süreci özellikle merkezi bürokrasinin doğma süreci ki Aslantepe bunun için çok önemli bir yerdir. Konularında çok önemli teorik ve kuramsal kavramsal çalışmaları var. Uh, so her presentation today, I am sure. Will be very important for all those interested in any aspect of archaeopolitics meetings. Actually, dolayısıyla çalışmaları archaeopolitics'in tam da hedeflediği kitleye yönelik çok farklı açılardan bize bir şeyler söyleyecektir eminim. Çünkü biz bir yıldır işin açığı kendisini burada ağırlamak için temastayız. Teşekkür ediyorum kendisine. I thank her for being with us today. I very well know that she is quite busy. So thanks, Professor, for your time. Your presence here is very dear to us. Much appreciated and welcome. Kendisine çok teşekkür ediyorum. Hocam hoş geldiniz. Aslında Türkçe biliyor fakat İngilizce sürüş yapmayı tercih etti. Merhaba hocam hoş geldiniz. Merhaba hoş bulduk. Ben, ben de çok çok teşekkür etmek istiyorum. Uh, it is an, an important opportunity for me. Every, every time I, I can speak with the Turkish friends and colleagues. Because you know I have grown practically I have grown in, in, in scientifically in Turkey and um, for, I have very close links to to to this country and to and to all my dear colleagues so even if it is true I am really very busy in this period but I'm happy to be here with you and uh, I hope not to be too long because you know the topic is quite uh, complex Indeed. and uh, I tried also of course as Lantebe will be a core on, in this lecture, but I try to compare with other areas in the Near East in order to understand the process of the formation of state in different regions and uh, according to different trajectories and different paths. Okay, thank you. Let me translate it if you want. Um, hocamız şimdilik ben tercüme yaptığım için e, hocamız e, önemli olan şuydu bence söyledikler için de. Önce nazik sözler için teşekkür ediyorum tabii ki. E, bilimsel olarak yetişmemde ve var olmamda Türkiye'deki çalışmalarım çok önemli dedi. Arslan Tepe ve onun özellikle yakın doğu diye andığı bölgedeki diğer çalışmalarla karşılaştırmalı bir şekilde. Tabii ki çok uzun bir konu. Kısa bir sürede e, halletmek durumundayız. Programın formatı gereği. Kendisine teşekkür ediyorum. The presentation would last some 50 minutes I guess. E, in the meantime you can e, share your comments and questions both in Turkish and English using the QA box on the Zoom screen. You will see on the top, uh, down there. Uh, Prof Professor Frangipani will answer your questions at the end of her presentation. Uh, sunuşu yaklaşık 50 dakika sürecek. Bu süre içerisinde sorularınız ve yorumlarınız olursa lütfen bunu QA kısmından, soru cevap kısmından yazınız. Hoca sunuşu bittiğinde bunları da yanıtlayacaktır. Although speaking Turkish quite fluently, as I said before, Professor Frangipani wanted to make this presentation in English. Therefore, a simultaneous Turkish interpretation will be provided, thanks to the generous support of the Embassy of Italy in Ankara. So first of all, please allow me to make some explanations, technical explanations regarding this interpretation process in Turkish. Then we'll start the program, Professor. Is that okay for you? Yes. Thank you. Evet, şimdi kısa bir açıklama yapacağım. Söylemeye çalıştığım gibi hoca Türkçe e, de bilmesine rağmen uzun yıllar burada çalıştı ama İngilizce olarak sunuşunu yapmayı tercih etti. Teşekkür ediyoruz kendisine. 
İngiliz yolcağı için de ve Türkiye'de biz mümkün olduğu kadar fazla kişiye ulaşmak istediğimiz için de e, sunuşunu Türkçe simultane çeviriyle size ulaştırmaya çalışacağız. Bu konuda da bize Ankara'daki İtalya Büyükelçiliği destek verdiler ve oradan bir görevle şu anda e, e, altta gördüğünüz tercüme sekmesinde ikinci kanalı Türkçe'ye tıklarsanız size hocanın e, metnini e, eş zamanlı olarak Türkçe sunuşla iletecek. E, sorularınızı da yine İngilizce ve Türkçe yazabilirsiniz. Hoca İngilizceye çevirme konusunda destek isterse ben zaten ona yardım edeceğim. Onun dışında Türkçe okuyup İngilizce'de cevaplamayı, cevaplamayı tercih edebilir sorulara göre. E, teşekkür ediyorum herkese ilgisi için. Şimdi İngilizce olarak programımıza devam ediyoruz. Dediğim gibi isteyenler ikinci kanala geçebilirler. Thanks for your time again, professor. And the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So I'm going to start with a short uh, premise. So first of all, I would like to address some reflections on what we mean when we speak of a state society, since the concept of state is not unequivocal. State is a political system based on a centralized government of a hierarchically ordered society whose leaders and or institutions are also capable to interfere, at least to some extent, in the economic management of the community, allocating and redistributing wealth. But there are various types and forms of state according to the different uh, types of societies in which it arose, and they show various types and degrees of invasiveness in the community economy and social life as well as various degrees of complexity and maturity of the system. Speaking about the birth of state, I will refer here only to early form of state, meaning with the term early, not only a chronological step, but qualitatively distinct features of uh, emerging centralized political government. The state as a complex of institutions and more generally as a political system as indeed a long history of development, transformation and consolidation processes often occurred in the same area. The socio-political system I'm going to describe here represents the very beginning of this long and varied process. This society certainly manifests social and economic hierarchies and were governed by a central power and political authority but the relations among the social components involved are often still in process of change and not yet definitely established. I think that I can share the, my screen with the PowerPoint. Yes, please. Oh, wrong page again. No, again wrong, yeah. So. Yes. Sorry, I will. No problem. I will open it again. Perhaps it's better. The PowerPoint again. Okay. Yes, now it's better. Yes, you can see Done. it. Yes. Okay. So I will make the. This is okay for you if I make the full screen? Yes, that's fine. Okay. So these systems are, uh, are usually flexible and dynamic in the sense that though they are new sociopolitical structures considerably different from the basically egalitarian pre-state societies from which they have developed, they were often not yet stable and solid. In some cases, these formative early state societies are moving in the direction of the consolidation of the new hierarchical social and political order, increasingly institutionalizing the structures and functions of the central government. In other cases, they conversely appear to be in a delicate and fragile equilibrium, still having to face social conflicts and resistance which sometimes make them prone to collapse. It is well known that one of the regions where the process of formation of early state societies took place for the first time was what we call the Near East, a mosaic of regions closely interrelated each other more than with any other region outside its external border. 
from the Neolithic onwards, at least, when agricultural sedentary societies emerged for the first time in the majority of this wide area. The various regions of this mosaic were, however, also different from one another in terms of their ecology, climate, resources, subsistence strategies, and social structures. And where the theater of the development of different, so continuously interrelated cultures. I would try to focus here on the variability of the dynamics that brought to the formation of early state societies in this vast and varied region, also rediscussing some traditional concept and approach to this phenomenon, such as the idea that the birth of state was intimately correlated everywhere with the birth of cities. I will br briefly focus on the dynamics through which the interaction between different environmental conditions, agricultural potentials, and original local economic and social structures brought about various forms of early centralized system, conditioning their different features and outcomes. Egypt, Mesopotamia, Anatolia, Iran, the Levant, were the theater of somehow parallel and to some extent interrelated phenomena, which however had different paths and brought to different forms and degrees of central power. Since this all-encompassing comparison cannot be addressed in a lecture, of course, I will mainly focus on one of the main areas traditionally considered the core of the earliest emergence of Christian state and urban societies, so the so-called Greater Mesopotamia, Adding, adding at the end some brief comparisons with other two regions, Egypt and Anatolia, Western Anatolia, I mean. Um, Greater Mesopotamia includes different regions within the whole large cultural world revolving around the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, from the Persian Gulf to the Zagros Piedmont and Southeastern Anatolia mountains. This vast and composite area while being characterized by close cultural interactions and parallel formative phenomena from the sixth millennium BC, shows a variety <clears throat> of natural environment, climatic conditions, and cultural, economic, and sociopolitical developments. I will distinguish and compare Southern Mesopotamia with its vast arid alluvial plains, which was the seat of an impressive urbanization phenomenon, Northern Mesopotamia, with a mosaic of environmentally varied regions and territorially diversified settlement patterns and subsistence systems, and the mountainous southeastern Anatolian region surrounding the Mesopotamian plain to the north and northeast, where the, um, which were traditionally considered peripheries of the Mesopotamian world, Whereas today, thanks to new plentiful archaeological data, including the data from Atlantepe, increasingly appear to have been active and creative participants in the phenomenon concerned. I will start with Southern Mesopotamia that coincides with the alluvial plain of the Tigris and the Euphrates River along the last portion of their courses where they flow toward the Persian Gulf and which is the area where the roots of unequal, hierarchical, and centralized societies seem to lie. This was a region characterized by potentials and resources of various kinds, including extensive plain lands suitable for cereal crops, other zone more suitable for horticulture, coastal and various lagoon and marshy lands, with plentiful fish and other water resources, pasture lands, both in the Zagros hilly flanks and in the same alluvial plain lands where cattle have been successfully bred. This region on the whole was however seriously exposed to risk because of the hot, dry and dry climate and the water logging of the soils prone to salinization. The vast plains offered great cereal product production potentials, provided that people were able to control water flows and regularly distributed it to the fields. I agree with the old theory proposed by Robert Adams 
that it was precisely the ecological differences in a restricted area that was probably one of the main reasons for the early development of economic centralization and the related distribution practices that have characterized Mesopotamian societies. Redistribution activities were based on the centralization of staples, that means agricultural and animal products, by the leaders of the community and were often carried out in public and elite environments, particularly in ceremonial contexts in the earliest phases. So you here see two of the two, tem two of the temples. One is from Meridu, so very early, the earliest one, and then the other from Telukai. They made it possible for basic products to widely circulate among different sectors of the population, hence attenuating the effects of food scarcity and micro crisis that might have arisen in some ecological zones. This type of coordination and economic control was probably fostered by a structure of the society that appears to have been based from the beginning on potentially stratified and unequal kinship-based relationship between large and competitive households. <coughs> Archaeological evidence in Mesopotamia already in the fifth millennium BC, so in the so-called Ubaid period. <coughs> large standardized tripartite houses, isolated from one another, and then clearly recognizable as distinct units, probably housed extended and perhaps competing families. The larger size of one or two of these houses <coughs> probably reflects the higher social position and function of some of these families, whose members may have performed the role of leaders of the community. No. <coughs> Sorry. Lower Mesopotamia also shows an early emergence of architecturally. Okay. No. Okay, there is something missing. Okay. Uh, monumental cultic buildings, probably temples, in which evidences of ceremonial food distribution was found, and which were the main places in which the community leaders seem to have performed their activities at the same time political, ceremonial, cultic, and economic. The ability of the leaders to increasingly get involved in the primary production system, mainly agriculture and animal breeding, indeed allowed them to increasingly accumulate stable resources and economic power. You can see here some of the seal images uh, representing uh, um, the activity that were probably controlled by central institutions. <coughs> And since foodstuff could not be stored because they were perishable, they must have been constantly reinvested by remunerating the work of an increasingly large number of individuals. This circuit, which probably began in a ritualized form in the fifth millennium, must have gradually been expanded in the fourth millennium BC also including the basic means of production, land and livestock. This system generated an increased, increasing numbers of impoverished individuals in need of support, thereby further fueling the system. <clears throat> Thousands of mass-produced bowls and hundreds of seal impressions, what we call cretule, as well as more than 3,000 pictographic tablets recording economic transactions, mainly distribution of food rations and allocation of land and livestock, have been found in the largest public ceremonial area of the Eanna precinct in the big city of Uruk This power, which was also by now economic power, continued to enjoy a legitimacy linked to the cultic sphere. The large sacred Deanna precinct at Turuk, which occupied a vast zone in the center of the city, consisted of numerous architecturally different buildings that were probably the headquarters of many different public activities, 
including the economic and administrative practices. The iconography of the late Turuk seals <clears throat> il illustrate the close relationship between the so-called king priest, the temple, and the public and ceremonial management of food as the three key elements holding up this system of centralized power, which characterized the political economy of the early Mesopotamian rulers in the fourth millennium BC and probably earlier. Credule and mass-produced balls show the vast scale of administratively controlled food circulation and redistribution. <clears throat> Sealing practices became the most effective tool to control both the circulation of goods and the people involved in the transactions in a highly articulated and complex society. Unfortunately, the material coming from Uruk is not in situ has not been found in situ or not been documented in situ. So um, we don't have the plenty of information we could have had, but anyway, the, the, the extraordinary quality and quantity of this material um, is enough to speak about this system. Administration and bureaucracy by delegating power to administrators made it possible for the authority to exercise control over a wider territory and over an increasing numbers of productive activities, as evidenced from the pictographic tablets on which the lexical list mentions craftsmen of various kinds hierarchically organized. The efficiency of this centralized system is improving the agricultural capacity of the territory, together with increasing degree of specialization and together, they also were at the basis of another important phenomenon that became a distinctive feature of Lower Mesopotamia, that is urbanization. The growth of very large cities in the Mesopotamian alluvium was an extraordinary phenomenon, very likely made, uh, very likely made possible, uh, possible the, uh, by the capacity of the territory to feed the high number of persons living in these huge cities. Uruk in this period was more than 150 hectares. Urbanization therefore was one of the factors that strengthened this early centralized system and played a key role in its stability. The city indeed produced an organic system of relations between specialized and interdependent components, economic, social, and political sectors, both within the city itself and in the surrounding territory, so that the involvement of the landscape became structural and not occasional, deeply transforming both production and exchange relations. Since an urban society also requires central coordination, even though urbanization is not always present in every emerging centralized political system, the two phenomena often came about in close conjunction. So an intensive urbanization of the territory, the, effect, the efficient conduction of agricultural and staple production, a sophisticated administration and bureaucracy, which by delegating power to various officials made it possible for the authority to exercise a wide and diffuse control, as well as the deeply rooted stratified social structure and its religious legitimization, all ensured stability to the political and economic system in Lower Mesopotamia. Economic strategies based on controlling staple goods and labor force and the resultant powerful interference in the population's primary economy and daily life by emerging political hierarchies was also the distinctive feature of the emergence of early state societies throughout the broader Mesopotamian world in the fourth millennium creating a radical, radical distinction between these societies and other societies in the Near East. But while the development of centralized and the redistributive societies of this kind was a distinctive feature of all the different regions of Greater Mesopotamia, <clears throat> significant differences can also be recognized between the regions forming part of this large heterogeneous world. 
<laughs> so the northern regions of Greater Mesopotamia varied widely and was characterized by different ecosystems <laughs> ranging from the narrower Middle Euphrates and Middle Tigris Valley, <coughs> where the arable land was rather limited in extension, to the vast steppe hills and plain lands of the Jazeera, to the Taurus and northwestern Zagros foothills and mountains suitable for grazing. <coughs> It was in this vast and varied environment that Neolithic societies developed a community-based economic organization, exploiting the varied territory of the Jazeera in specialized and probably coordinated ways. Specialized hunting of onagers and gazelle in semi-arid steppes, rain-fed farming in areas with sufficient rainfall, sheep and goat rearing in mountainous and hilly areas and foothills. A clear indication of this kind of organization by year-round or seasonally specialized groups from the earliest phases of Pottery Neolithic in the 7th and 6th millennia BC were the small settlement of Asuna and Alaf periods, very widespread in all this area, and the emergence in some villages of large collective store buildings for the conservation either of game as at Umdabagia or agricultural produce, particularly cereals, as at Sabiabiad in Syria. The very early emergence in the stores of Sabiabiad of hundreds of clay ceilings bearing the impression of numerous different seals, and the fact that the ceilings had been subsequently set aside in some small rooms, the rooms that are colored in red here in the slide, <clears throat> probably indicated the origins of a collective administrative management of the storage and redistribution of community food, using the removed ceilings for recording and checking the performed withdrawals by various families or kin, kinship groups. We can hypothesize this from the uh, iconography of the seals that are grouped in, in um, iconographic uh, uh, families, types, indicating probably there were links between these individuals. Uh, these kinship, kinship groups who were probably leaving the village for some seasonal activities, so they had to store the food uh, in common. Increasing contacts and interaction with the Southern Mesopotamian societies and the possible parallel difficulties of the local Alaf communities to manage expanding population gave rise to significant changes in the social and political organization of the Northern Mesopotamian societies too. The Southern Mesopotamian model <clears throat> was adopted also in these regions with adaptation to local traits and traditions, thus creating a new hybrid society. At the same time, the successful experiment of systematic administration of the redistribution practices in the collective storehouses of, of the Neolithic period <clears throat> also spread to the South. And from being a tool aimed at guaranteeing the equal distribution of resources, it became everywhere in the north and in the south, it became a very effective means of control in the hand of, of privileged groups and individuals. And these are the distribution of seals and ceilings at Tepegaura in the temple area, so also in the public buildings. Uh, but the societies in the north were fairly varied in their types of environmental adaptation, subsistence strategies, and social organization. It was no coincidence that in the fourth millennium BC, urbanization, in the full sense of the term, only occurred in the Habur area, which was a peculiar ecological niche with large plains and plentiful water availability, allowing an increasing agricultural output to such an extent that it could sustain a huge urban population. The main urban site in this region uh, in the fourth millennium was Telbrak, 
which reached a size of about 100 hectares in, um, and showed monumental architecture, at least since the beginning of the fourth millennium BC. Seals and ceilings, as well as the appearance of prototypes of numerical tablets, reveal the performance, also in the Kabur area, of fairly widespread redistribution and administrative practices carried out in elite and public context, and probably also in private environments, as suggested by the finding of numerous ceilings in a house of the nearby site of Tel Amukar. Even though the rise of centralized economic and political system was fairly widespread in various northern regions of Greater Mesopotamia, the exclusive presence of a truly urban phenomenon in the well-watered plains of the Kabul Basin once more highlights the causal relationship between great potentials for agricultural production, forms of central control on this production, and urbanization. The more favorable rainfall rates and agricultural management, on the other hand, probably left a greater degree of autonomy to the rural population of the Jazeera, <clears throat> apparently generating a different type of relationship between the city and its territory compared with southern Mesopotamia. The enormous and continuous growth of the city of Uruk seems to have demanded an increasingly large territory around it, totally dominating its interland and sending the population away. So to create a vast, near, nearly empty space with only few villages and, fa and uh, farmlands, perhaps as a component of the urban environment designed to support and feed its inhabitants. The city of Telbrak that you see on your right side in the north appears conversely to have attracted population around it in a more dynamic, engaging and interactive system of territorial relations. So two different models. Hierarchical and centralized societies of the Mesopotamian type also developed in the northernmost periphery, so-called periphery of Greater Mesopotamia, in the Anatolian Upper Euphrates Valley. Even though the climate was favorable and the uh, high rainfall rate allowed this population to easily carry out a very productive agriculture, well integrated with animal husbandry and pastoralism, no real urban phenomenon, and phenomenon has been identified in these regions. Here, the lack of wide-ranging plainlands and the presence of mountains <clears throat> probably hampered the sufficiently broad expansion of agriculture to support the formation of large urban centers, while environmental diversity appears uh, to have encouraged the economic integration of various components, including mobile pastoralist groups, favored by the presence of rich pastoral lands and the easy access to vertical transhumans. In this region, an extraordinary example of the development of a powerful early state center is Aslantepe a site which, despite being the largest mound in the region, does not exceed five hectares, making it a small site in Mesopotamian terms. The growth of a ruling elite is attested in the site, at least from the beginning of the fourth millennium BC, in the so-called late Chalcolithic three, that is period seven in the Aslantepe sequence, when it was already a local powerful center without any clear indication of Southern influence in the material culture, but sharing with the South some important organizational traits. In this period, the settlement seems to have reached its maximum expansion, densely occupying the whole mound and a sharp social and symbolic differentiation between the occupied area has been evidenced with monumental elite buildings on the top of the ancient mound and common houses on the slopes and on the margins of the settlement. 
It is on the highest part of the old mound that a complex of imposing buildings on the top of the um, and, um, sorry um, imposing building were found with walls some one meter twenty centimeter thick decorated with wall paintings of white plaster and with mud brick columns lined um, lined up along the walls. These buildings do not show any traces of public activities and appear to have been residences of high rank families. Unlike Mesopotamia, no evidence has been found of any administrative activities in these elite residences, whereas the economic administrative transactions were only concentrated in two large public ceremonial building, buildings, probably temples, which were built adjacent to the elite residences and in continuity with them in the last phase of period seven, dated around 3500 BC. The two ceremonial buildings, Temple C and Temple D, Temple D is destroyed by the, by the following palace, uh, both yielded hundreds of mass produced bowls and hundreds of clay ceilings with seal impressions, partly found in one of the side rooms of Temple C, you can see here in the slide, and um, where they were probably temporarily set aside and partly discarded in successive damp layers in a dismissed stair room of the corner of Temple D. You see here, uh, the, the bowls and ceilings in Temple C. We, in Temple C, we found more than 1,000 mass produced bowls in Thai. And here, the, the clay ceilings and bowls mm, thrown away in this damp area uh, in the corner of Temple D. The ceilings show the impression of stamp seals alone some with geometric designs, but more frequently depicting animals, particularly lions and goats, whose style and iconography are partly original and partly linked to a northern Syro-Mesopotamian Syro tradition. Nothing to do with the South. The Atlantepe elite in this period, therefore, centralized and redistributed staple goods in the form of food, in a sort of sacred ceremonial context, similar to the Mesopotamian model, which had probably derived, I think, from the spreading of the Mesopotamian obeyed culture up to the Malatya plain in the fifth millennium BC, where uh, Deimen Tepe is one uh, uh, clear example. We are therefore dealing with a society that perhaps grew on the basis of an early sharing of elements with the Mesopotamian world and seemed to have developed on that initial basis its own autonomous growth toward a social, economic, and political system that was parallel and structurally similar, but not identical to that of its southern neighbors. A great development and at the same time a radical change occurred around 3400 BC corresponding to the later period of, um, in Mesopotamia and to be a 6a in the Atlantepe sequence. The temples were abandoned and replaced by a completely different public area where the contact with the public was not anymore in a sacred area dominated by temples, but in a huge courtyard where people gathered and were received by the authority in an imposing building at the edge of this courtyard what we call an audience building, which did not exhibit any element resembling any kind of religious function. You see here the courtyard and the building are really big and monumental. Here, a series of align aligned platforms indicated, uh, indicated the places where the person in authority gave audience to the people. The one surrounded by the yellow circle is higher and uh, there were wood, juniper wood on top that I think it was a seat or a throne. And, and the other small uh, platform uh, is very, very low. 
So um, people were probably standing in front of the authority at predetermined fixed points according to well-codified secular ceremonies. This is uh, uh, two views of the platform that I want to show you just because of the comparison with a very, very interesting comparison with a, a very similar platform with three steps uh, found in the Mari Palace in the second millennium BC, so much, much later. <clears throat> New buildings, so this building connected the new public area with the elite residential building behind it. New buildings with many different public functions, political, economic, representation, and cultic, were pro added progressively, thus expanding the monumental complex to cover more than 3,000 square meters in the area brought to light so far and making it the earliest example of a palace that has ever been discovered so far in the Near East. Cultic practices were also performed, like you see here, a reconstruction of this, uh, of the public part of this complex. Cultic practices were also performed in two small temples, but the ceremonial consumption of meals was however reserved there only for a few, perhaps the ruling elites. There is no access to the main cult room, so people remained outside. Unlike the previous temples of Field 7, people seem to have been excluded by ceremonies and cult practices remaining outside the cult room. It would therefore appear that the process had begun to exclude the population from the ceremonial religious event while the authority was exercised in the large courtyard where people gathered and the ruler appeared publicly and acted directly without any religious mediation. Even though the religious legitimacy of the leaders must still have been the main rationale for the consensus to their authority, and we have proof of this, but I cannot uh, explain it now here, the way political power was exercised seems to have radically changed, becoming more secular, while the separation and the ideological detachment of the ruling elite from the rest of the, of the, of the population grew wider. Even the iconography of power expressed in seals and paintings in the Atlantepe Palace seemed to have referred to agriculture and related activities, whereas Differently from Southern Mesopotamia, it does not show any reference to the ritual or religious sphere. In this huge and monumental early palatial complex, in addition to a wide variety of public functions, redistribution of food took place in a secular way in central stores and courtyards. The data obtained at Atlantepe confirmed that the goods accumulated and centrally managed were essentially food and the labor needed to, to produce it. This is evidenced from the type of small storerooms, not designed for long storage of durable wealth, but full of vessels, pitoy and jars, probably containing processed foodstuff, which had to be continuously re-put into circulation. I mean the food. <clears throat> Large numbers of cretule seal impressions and mass produced bowls were connected with food management and distribution to large number of people in non cultic environment. These people must have therefore been workers offering their labor and services to the central institution and being compensated with food. An enormous concentration of administrative material consisting of more than 2,200 well-preserved ceilings bearing the impression of 211 different seals with a variety of forms, styles, and iconographies have been found on the hall in the, in the, um, on the, hall in the palace, and the majority of them was concentrated in dams, here colored in red again, where the ceilings had been discarded after use 
and after having been checked and probably accounted. This is one of these dumps where we found the ceilings grouped by types of uh, transaction performed and seal impressed. So this means that they were uh, grouped together before being uh, uh, thrown away. So uh, the sealing operation must all have taken place on the spot and very large number of seals is therefore indicative of the larger number of people, large number of people involved and the extraordinary size of the bureaucratic administ administrative apparatus. We could also reconstruct um, a hierarchy of officials according to the um, transaction performed by each seal. Bureaucracy was born with the delegation of a large amount of task and responsibility to a large number of individuals both at Atlantepe and in Mesopotamia. But here at Atlantepe, the system is documented in greater detail by an extraordinary amount of in situ materials. <clears throat> the monumentality and planning, uh, the architectural and functional differentiation between sectors and their close linkage, which made up a unitary joined up wall, make it possible to define this exceptional architectural complex as a very early form and experimental form of full-fledged palace. The audience building remained the political heart of the whole complex until the end, as shown by the concern to ensure that the platform throne occupied an overriding visible position from the very entrance to the palace, even after adding new sectors. The political economy of the Atlante rulers, which had remarkably expanded their control over the production and circulation of the staple goods, also enhanced a form of specialized pastoralism, as shown by a radical change in the animal breeding practices with a remarkable decrease in the more domestic pigs and an extraordinary increase in sheep and goats. The external relationship of the site grew considerably in this period, involving mountain groups, perhaps of non-sedentary population, moving in the surrounding regions and somehow linked to the north central and northeastern Anatolian world. The intensive interaction with these groups moving across regions very rich in metal ores is also to be seen in the development of a sophisticated metallurgy at Atlante Bay in this period. Different kind of metals and uh, the well-known weapons. Notwithstanding the increasing pressure and control exercised by the central leaders on staple production and various resources, I think that the majority of the population must have continued practicing their agricultural and subsistence activity auto autonomously in the well-watered Malatya Plain, where besides abundant rainfall, <clears throat> there were many springs whose water could have been easily captured and brought to the fields, thanks to the peculiar hydrogeological karst conditions. And the same can probably be said for pastoralist groups. I mean, that remained fairly autonomous from the central power. Even though the control over staple production may have given the ruling class a greater power over the life of the local people, I think that the new hierarchies on the one end lacked the solid social structure based on hierarchical kinship ties. Uh, as it, it probably was the case in Southern Mesopotamia. On the other hand, Atlantepe lacked the urban structure, which had uh, created in Mesopotamia an organic and strongly integrated system of specialized and interdependent sectors in um, linked each other in a, in a structural way. While the dimension of the public area in its, uh, and its activities increased, the whole site became smaller in size than in the past, increasingly keeping the people out of the settlement and excluding them from participating in the most important events 
and ceremonies performed by the central institutions. The common population might have lived in the plain around the site, probably scattered in small villages and farms. The lack of a real concentration of population in the main political administrative center or around it is one of the characteristic features of the centralized system developed in the Malatya Plain, distinguishing it from the Mesopotamian model in that it is a form of political and economic centralization without urbanization. The society of the Malatya Plain seems to have essentially been a dichotomous society consisting of two main social categories, the dominant elite and the, uh, the submitted population. And so the increasing demands by the central power may have become ever more unsustainable, generating conflicts that weakened the palace system, also exposing it to possible outbreaks of conflict with the pastoralists until this caused its definitive collapse. Whereas the development towards more mature states continued both in Southern Mesopotamia and in the Kabul region in the North, both areas characterized by a remarkable urbanization phenomenon, the precocious manifestation and collapse of a, of a palatial system based on a secular power underscore the complexity and variety of the dynamics that led to the formation of the state and centralized societies in this wide region, outlining non-linear, regionally diversified and experimental processes made of innovative development as well as of failures. <clears throat> there is, however, another yet different case in the Near East that I only want to briefly mention here. The case of Egypt, coinciding with the Nile Valley, where the very long course of the river running from Sudan to Lower Egypt crosses different environments and latitudes with very peculiar ecological conditions, <clears throat> among which the deserts surrounding the valley, which create a kind of extensive, albeit narrow, oasis-like territory. As many authors have pointed out, this very special environment certainly powerfully conditioned the type of development of pre-dynastic societies, <clears throat> which were initially organized by small, partly mobile, perhaps tribal groups, performing diverse activities in various and different, differing environments at different times of the year. This organization, together with the difficulties arising from the peculiar climate and ecological uh, condition of the region, may have encouraged the concentration of a political authority in the hands of few paramount chiefs who may have coordinated the subsistence activities and in some cases perhaps improved public work, such as irrigation system, and also controlled long distance exchange probably contributing to prevent tribal conflict. The political role of the leaders in managing conflict as early as pre-dynastic times is indeed also well attested in the iconography. <clears throat> At the same time, the development of substantial administrative practices and the existence of infrastructure such as storehouse for, for stocking food under the control of these central leaders have been clearly documented from the proto-dynastic proto uh, uh, period onward and show that in Egypt, as in Mesopotamia, a form of early state interfering in the population staple economy had been established very early. These leaders acquired a very strong central power, which was expressed by founding monumental official buildings use it as residence for administrative ceremonial activities and as funerary monuments. The environmental conditions appear to have prevented, here too, substantial aggregation of population in large, integrated and permanently occupied sites. 
No real urban centers can be recognized, in my opinion, in the early phases of Egyptian history, in spite of the very strong centralization of power. Concentration of population around the public or cultic centers or in special regions suitable for agriculture, as at Hieracompolis that you see here in the slide, were not stable, sometimes being related to the need for concentrating labor force for special purposes, such as public works. This settlement significantly changed across time, revealing different unstable patterns and forms, which make them scarcely comparable to the real large and permanent cities in Mesopotamia. The case of Egypt shows that, as it happened in the upper Euphrates Valley, urbanization process was not one of the components of the early state developments. Here, however, the role of the ruling chiefs was probably more intrinsically needed to coordinate and make the subsistence strategies of small dispersed communities efficient, guaranteeing the circulation of food and basic resources over a wide and risk area. <clears throat> this gave rise to a strong central power, which was also supported by a powerful ideology focused on funerary rituals and the afterlife, which turned to be a very effective means of establishing consensus. The powerful Upper Egypt, uh, Egypt leaders expanded their influence and control these are some example of tombs and funerary rituals. Um, uh, they, they expanded their influence control towards Lower Egypt, and the various regional political entities of the early phases were thus transformed into a real vast territorial state. The complexity and variety of the state formation process and development in the Near East is therefore great. But beyond the differences, there is, in my opinion, a characteristic that the state must necessarily have in order to be called such. This is a structure strongly interacting with the population, coordinating and influencing large sectors of their daily life, social relations, and economy, and resulting in a strong mutual interdependence. This was not the case in my opinion, in another well-known Anatolian region, Western Anatolia, where no real state formation or urbanization process can be recognized in the early formative phases. The communities living in the broad valleys surrounding the central plateau and the coastal zones with a temperate Mediterranean climate with sufficient rainfall to permit successful rain-fed farming and a resource-rich natural environment practice the classical type of domestic and household-run agriculture and livestock economy based on domestic storage continuing from the Neolithic period. And even by the early third millennium, the so-called urban societies belonging to the Troy culture were not, in my opinion, truly urban in the Mesopotamian sense nor has any archaeological evidence been found of any marked centralization or interference in the population stable economy by the elite, who demonstrated their privileged status and distinctiveness from the rest of the population by living and carrying out their activities in small separated fortified citadels, where they seem to have mainly concentrated luxury goods, particularly metal objects. It is possible that in this case, the political economy of the dominant and high-ranking groups, whose authority and power were certainly growing, may have been based on the so-called wealth finance, that is the economy of durable and craft goods, <clears throat> and perhaps on the control and protection of trade routes. <clears throat> Uh, both within Anatolia and outside it towards the Aegean. So the distribution of the famous uh, Depades in the late phase of early Bronze Age 
is an, um, an indication of this widespread contact and uh, interaction. <clears throat> um, so while there is a rich metal production in the sites belonging to the Troy culture, supported uh, by the widespread presence of metal ores in Anatolia, and metal objects seem to mark differences in rank expressed in funerary rituals and grave goods, there was no evidence of centralized food control, redistribution of food and administration. And there is no clear evidence, this is the case of Kuluaba, where there are storage areas in the main uh, elite uh, building and complex of building, but no indication of of redistribution of ceilings of control of these activities. <clears throat> and there is no clear evidence of really internally differentiated lower town, which had mainly developed in phase two of early bronze Troy culture, nor territorial economic networks in terms of what have been described for Mesopotamia. On the other hand, the Anatolian citadel model was totally unknown in the Mesopotamian world. So to conclude, so the so-called complex and hierarchical societies were emerging everywhere in the Near East in the course of the fourth and third millennium BC, we cannot say the same for the state and urban formations which have different stories according to the social and natural environments and to the socioeconomic and political function of the leadership in different societies. The complexity and variety, and variety of different alternative models by more thoroughly analyzing and comparing different historical cases may in the future, I think, enable us to develop new theoretical and anthropological reflections on categories and concepts that are too often taken for granted, whereas they can be deconstructed, paving the way for a different understanding and knowledge of our past and of our present. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thanks a lot. It was a great presentation. Could you please close the yes. screen? Okay, thank you. Teşekkür ediyoruz Franci Pani Hoca'ya. Arkeopolitiksin genel bakışı olduğu üzere bize aslında tarihin ya da bu dönemlerin sadece arkeologlar tarafından değil siyaset bilimciler tarafından da çalışılması gerektiğini bir kez daha gösterdi. As the moderator, I shouldn't ask any questions actually. <gülüyor> But I cannot help myself saying that not only archaeologists, but also political scientists, lawyers, and other people should also study these uh, periods because they are very important for all of us. Thank you, Professor. Now Thank we have some you. questions. Thank you. Uh, can you see the questions from the QA part? From the uh, Q&A. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. I Mr. Yavuz has some questions. Can you, yeah, you can see. Yes. Thanks for your presentation. No, what kind of ties? With the Sumerian city state or the European and other calculated settlements. So, um, <clears throat> he has some other questions. Maybe you can read them as well. Okay. And answer all of them all together. Okay, Yavuz, which was in the Thank you, Mr. Yavuz, by the way. To exist here in monarchy or despotic chief decision. Mm -hmm. So I, I will answer first this part. Okay, so, please. To Mr. Yavuz. So, of course, uh, as I told at the beginning, there is a development in the Mesopotamian region towards a more solid and more, uh, we can say, mature state system. So the city-states of Mesopotamia are the development of this kind of uh, process. So it's a consolidation of, a, we can say, a small territorial uh, control. 
as in the Uruk period. There were different cities controlling different territories. And of course, Uruk was so big that its territory was the biggest one, but they were anyway small. And only later in the second half of third millennium, this system develop into real empire system. So uh, territorial state, because uh, it's a long story, of course, it's difficult to, to uh, narrate it here now, but these city states were conflicting each other. And at one point there was domination by one of them and uh, a new a new type of system, and this I think is linked to the to the form that the state had in Mesopotamia, because the state institutions needed um, to extract resources from the population. So the tendency to expand the territory, as it also happened today, unfortunately, the tendency to expand the territory is because of the, uh, the, the wish to uh, exploit these resources. And so at, what, at this point, we have um, two, two phenomena. One was the, the trade that developed a lot. I think that trade system in, in the Mesopotamian uh, societies at the beginning was not so important. There were, of course, there was trade, long distance trade, but it was not basic. But at one point it became basic because metallurgy developed with bronze. So that means uh, tin uh, with copper and tin is found only in few places. So they need to trade from long distance. And so, and the metal objects were not only luxury objects, prestige objects, but they became use objects. They became tools and weapons. And so it, this goes together with the development of military apparatus. In Atlantepe, we have these weapons very early because I think the Atlantepe case is, a, is special in this case too, because they were in danger. So the system was really uh, fragile. And so at one point they had to defend themselves. And in fact, we found in the site a, a town wall, so-called a town wall, a, a defensive wall around the palace that closed the, the monumental entrance to the palace. So this is later. So it's at the end of the period, they had problems with the population. They had to protect themselves. And so they uh, displayed weapons as a, as, as a display of strength. So it's a development. It's not... Uh, it's it's a process. Okay. Then there is another question. Does Atlantepe iconography show similarities with Sumerian societies? Do you think it has a connection with the South to a common belief system? Okay, there are some uh, very few iconographic uh, uh, comparison with the Mesopotamia because the belief system was different. As I showed you the, the main uh, iconography in seal, in paintings, in other uh, expression was completely original, local and different. Of course, they used some uh, very few uh, special iconographies as a kind of emulation, probably, of the Mesopotamian um, ruling uh, or rulers uh, that they know so they are, they were in contact certainly so there are some uh, copy the, the kind of emulation of this but very few in general is local then there is have ancient genetic analysis being conducted in Atlantepe so what genetic ah, this may be Ilmas would answer better than, than me <laughs> <laughs> yes Yes, we did, and Hilmas is involved in this project. Uh, of course, what I can say is, um, Hilmas Erdal, of course, um, what I can say, uh, just a comment from an archaeological point of view. So the results we have, this has been considered um, uh, Irano-Caucasian groups. 
but this uh, in the interpretation of this need i think more sample more analysis and more uh, not only from atlantic but also from other side i don't know if uh, uh, you agree with me but we have few data to really reconstruct which is the origin of this population i think we need to work more then thailand So uh, what were the seals? So the seals, we made analysis, we, we have very few real seals. We have uh, seal impressions, um, but uh, we made analysis um, with the microscope of the traces, uh, where traces left in the impression by the object, by the seal. And for many of them, we could reconstruct different material. So the seal were, seals were made of stone, of course, the majority, but also of metals, of bone, and of wood. That is very interesting because in this case, we, we will not find, of course, any, any seal because wood is, is destroyed. The role of women. Ah. Very difficult to say, of course, but unfortunately, I think the role of women was not was not very important, even at least in the Mesopotamian uh, southern Mesopotamian societies. Um, I I say this because, of course, it was important in some respect. So there were in the later phases, not in the Uruk period. In later phases, there are some some uh, women that were important, so were considered um, at the level of high hierarchy. But in general, uh, we have the uh, information from the ration um, distribution to people, so food distribution, that um, in the in the tablets and in uh, also in the pictographic tablets and in the cuneiform tablets, that women received half or much less than men in food for the same work. So the same problem we have today was already present at that time, unfortunately. So. A question by Onur Kivan. Can you understand it in Turkish? Yes. Uh-huh. So if I understood well, uh, what we can say, it, of course, it's a very good question, this, because um, the relationship between uh, agriculturalists and pastoralists that were two different, in my opinion, they were in Atlanta, but two different communities but living together and being uh, in some coordinated somehow by the palace, by the, the, the, the main central system for a while. But they were living uh, in a different autonomous way and they interacted each other, but we don't know if they were conflicting or if they were cooperating. What I think is that they probably um, cooperated when they destroyed the palace. I don't know if I answered it correctly, but please tell me if I, if I understood. He, uh, he asks if the system was secular, how could they collect and, and, and redistribute? And if, because you know, usually we assume that religion is needed or something like that. Yes, so what yes. was their power coming from? Where were they? coming from as i told uh, before is the so they were able to control and coordinate these uh, products probably by um, giving in return some other things or services um, but not enough, I think, not enough to control them. So this is why I, at one point these people rebelled. 
So they were not obliged to give tributes or things probably, or they were, but uh, to some extent. So there was probably uh, a, a certain level of uh, autonomy uh, and they could at one point, um, they didn't uh, want to, to suffer this kind of pressure uh, because there was no religion. There was no, no, at least there was religion, but it was not the, the means they used it to exercise their power anymore. This is why it was too early. They, were, they had not the basis, social basis, political basis, urban basis, to maintain this system without a religious consensus. So probably this is why they couldn't uh, manage to continue. Okay. And you see Evrim Ulaşan? Evrim, yes. Yeah, only okay. greetings. And uh, Mehmet has done greetings. Greetings from me too. <laughs> Yeah, and <laughs> this should be, uh, yes, uh -huh. and then Anonym should be Aysun Hoca from uh -huh. Avant. The state formation video, I know. <laughs> uh, difficult, no, uh, no, I think that um, some uh, technological or innovative development goes together uh, with the needs for this. So I don't think that hunter gatherers was thinking about uh, things like that. So they, they, and in America and Africa, well, in Africa, there were some connections because through, for example, Egypt and the Northern coast on the Northern part of Africa with the Near East and, with, and then with the Mediterranean. But the Americas were, was completely independent uh, development. Aylan Uja asks again and says, he was not asking about the material of the seals. My purpose ah. was using seals, the purpose of using seals. Ah, seals, the, purpose, the purpose, the purpose of using seals. Yeah. Ah, okay. So this is this is very important question because this is why I showed you that this system started in the Neolithic. In a special case, not everywhere, in Chataluyuk, there is no use of, of seal in the in the administrative way. Mm, but in the northern Mesopotamia, yes, because as I told you, probably because people had to, to move, they were uh, organized in different specialized groups, so they had to move every and, and leave their harvest uh, with the guardian or somebody who, who take care of it. But when they come back, how they can get their own food? So a system uh, was invented to create a way of uh, like a signature, you know, the seal is a signature. So the person who has a seal, the seal is personal, cannot be exchanged with some other person. Each individual has its own seal. And so when I go there and I take something, I sign the makpus, you know? So putting the seal on the clay is like signing a receipt. So the, the person who is in charge of the storeroom, either it is a, just a guardian or it is an official, he has in his hand your seal impression. That means that you already had your uh, food or whatever you need. So it's a way of controlling uh, uh, that nobody take too much or twice, that everybody take what they they can or they are allowed to withdraw. Uh, and the seal is the, the signature, is the identification of the person. I don't know if I... Uh, uh, yes, thank now. you. 
Thank you. Yes. Uh, anonim Rossi's katılımcı gerekli görülürse genetik uh, and, and again he or she says çok az kadın iskeleti var. There were very few female skeletons. Onlarda bazıları da mistik akıyor diye yazdıklarını gösteriyor. Yılmaz Hoca değil galiba. Aysun Hoca. Abdullah sesini açabiliriz. Uh, if he or she wants to say something. There are female, but... Yes, skeleton, there are. skeletons. Yes, yes, there are. Eğer gerekirse bir iki cümle söyleyebilirim. Ya, Yılmaz Hocam siz misiniz? Buyurun. Bendim, bendim, bendim. Buyurun. Yanlış yeri işaretlemişim. Önce bu genetik yapıyla ilgili şeyi belki söyleyebilirim. Bizim Hı -hı. hem Arslantepe, daha sonra da iki step üzerine yaptığımız çalışmalar, hani benzer dönemlere ait. İran, Güney Kafkas etkili popülasyonların giderek hem Anadolu'da hem de Mezopotamya'da giderek etkilerin arttığını biz görüyoruz. Silaha dayalı popülasyonların da muhtemelen bu genetik yapıyı Arslantepe gibi popülasyonların içerisine kattığına ilişkin bir ipucu var. Bir diğer şey de popülasyonlar Tunç çağında birbirine daha çok benziyor ve uzak mesafeli gruplar arasındaki etkileşim giderek artıyor gibi görünüyor. Arslan Tepe bunu en iyi yansıtan popülasyonlardan birisini gösteriyor. Bu, da, bu nedenle belki de hani bu Arslan Tepe'den ele geçen silahları da düşünürsek burada silaha dayalı gücün aslında bu erken devlet sistemlerinin oluşması ya da kentleşmede çok etkili ve üretim tüketim ilişkilerinin kontrol altına alınmada da etkili olduğu gibi bir izlenim veriyor benim açımdan da. Ve popülasyonlar heterojen ama bu sadece Arslan Tepe özgü değil. Erken Tunçağ'ındaki birçok popülasyon çok heterojen. Yani Hı -hı. popülasyonlar arasındaki ilişki çok güçlü ve değerli devam eden bir etki gösteriyor. Birden bir popülasyon değişimi olmuyor. Zaman içerisinde herkes birbirine benzemeye başlıyor ve çok çeşitli genetik yapıyı temsil ediyor. Birinci söyleyeceğim bu ve hani güneyden ziyade daha işte yüksek yaylalardaki işte Kurarak ya da Kafkas popülasyonlarının etkisi giderek artıyor ve zirveye ulaşıyor sanki. İkinci e, soru içinde hani bu kadınların etkisi neydi diye bizim yerleşme içerisinde az sayıda e, iskeletimiz var. Çoğu bebek ve kadın. Bu da daha çok o yerleşme içerisinde gömülü bireylerin e, hani e, kadın ve çocuklara e, terk edilmiş bir ölü gömme geleneğini e, temsil ettiğini kadınlar üzerinde yaptığımız analizlerde de daha çok domestik aktivitelerle ilgilendiğini e, görüyoruz. Ee, az sayıda yetişkin iskeletimiz var e, kolektif gömü gibi. E, onlar da e, şiddetle öldürüldüklerine ilişkin ipuçları e, taşıyor. Bu anlamda da iki grup arasında aslında hani e, e, hem e, e, işlevsel hem de gündelik aktivitede belirgin farklılaşmanın olduğunu e, işaret ediyor. Besleme modelleri de farklılaşıyor. E, i̇zotop analizleri de buna ilişkin ipuçları veriyor. Teşekkür ediyorum. Marcella çok güzeldi. Ee, çok teşekkürler. <gülüyor> teşekkürler. Size teşekkür evet. Yılmaz. It was important that you could explain this point. Okay. Uh, by the there way, we are, are running other, out of time. There are many other questions. Yes, and we are running out of time. So, please, no more questions. She will only answer the present uh -huh. ones. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, there is a question by Inan Aydoğan. Yes. Uh, that is mainly a reflection. Um, and uh, he says the, the, the state is also fragile. Yes, it is. It can be. It depends on the conditions. This is why I made these different examples. Uh, and Atlanta Bay is a case of this frag fragility and collapse. So, of course, it can can collapse. And then, um, again, Yavuz. Ah, if the state could be established by external power. Well, not in this phase, uh, because we are speaking about a local development, even if there are influences, even if there are 
emulation, even if there are interactions, but it's not uh, imposed from, from outside. But later, in, in imperial phase, of course, if an empire expands its power to other regions, it can change the political system in the new region. So, of course, there can be also cases of imposition from outside. Um, private, private ownership. Uh, well, uh, perhaps part, perhaps we can say yes, even if we have to to agree on what we mean when we say private. Um, but families, for example, I think that in Mesopotamia, families were owner of land because there are uh, texts in the cuneiform tablet explaining that the chief of the family, so the, the head of the family, was responsible for, for selling the land. So this means they, they were owner of this land. So there was a kind of, uh, of ownership. Okay. Uh, and Julia says something in Italian? <laughs> yes, no, Julia says, uh, okay, she was, she was happy to, to hear me after so long time, because it, it, in, a, in fact, it's a long time that we, don't, we had not opportunities to speak each other. But I hope, uh, Julia, that in the future, uh, we will be more in contact. Okay, then, then yes. We trace the imagine it is possible to observe this towards Arabia to the south. Well, uh, the case of Arabia is different because it's a desert zone and um, we don't have real, uh, in these phases, we don't have real state organization. We have um, certainly trade with Mesopotamia. We have, there are relations, but state, I don't think so. And the last question. Okay, Thailand, a kind of bill to represent the deposit of crop or cattle, one depot, op. Uh, yeah. I don't understand. Regarding the seals, I think he's saying. Uh, regarding the seals, okay. Uh, yes, it, it is interesting because what we could reconstruct in Atlantepe, usually people, when when uh, um, there are many other places where there are sealed objects and so on, and people use it, uh, usually speaks immediately about trade. So as these objects come sealed from outside. But this is not the case. Well, there can be, of course, also objects that come from outside sealed. But the majority of sealing activity is local. Uh, and we have the proof of this in Atlanta Bay because of the analysis we made of clay. Clay is all local. And, um, and also the seal designs and iconographies and the, so most of all, the activity that are repeated. So the same seal has been impressed on the same containers several times. So what the, so the function of the seal is more than sealing something that, that has been given to, to the state or to the palace, is to, to seal uh, what they took from the palace. So there is a, an official that gives them food. So he, uh, he opened the, the vessel, give food to the, to the people, to this person. And when it finished, he finished, this person, he closed again the container with clay and the person who took the food put his seal. Because this is why I, saw, I told you is a kind of receipt, a kind of macpus because it's the signature of uh, demonstrating that this person already had. And this is why they put these seals aside. In Atlanta, we have a very, I cannot explain here now that in detail, but just to mention, in the storeroom, redistribution storeroom, we have a lot of seal impressions, sealings, put aside in a corner of the room after they had been removed from the containers, they were not thrown away, but they were put aside. And this is probably because they were 
um, kept for a while until they made, they accounted them at the end of ad, an administrative period in order to see how many times uh, uh, Marcella took or how many times her dam took. And so after they put them together, so they throw away. It, it was a kind of a discarded archive. But it's the proof of the uh, withdrawal. So it was sort of a security mechanism as well. I think. Yes, yes. It's, it's a security for the official because yes. he can demonstrate that uh, what is missing from the storeroom has been given. He is not responsible for taking something illegally because he has de to demonstrate how many times people have taken food or whatever. Okay. It's, very, it's a very clever system that is still in use to uh, is still in use after the writing started. Yes. So this is before writing, but when the writing started, the system continued. Okay. Professor French Pane, thank you. Teşekkürler. Grazie. Good to all of you. <laughs> Thank you to all of you. Çok teşekkür ederim. Ya birkaç el kaldı kaldırıldığını görüyorum ama hem süremiz bitti. Thank you to the to the, to the tercüman. Yes, Cem Bey. Cem Bey, that was a quite uh, I think heavy work. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Archaeopolitik izleyicilerine de teşekkür ediyoruz. Gelecek ay tekrar sizleri görmek istiyoruz. Hocam, thanks again. Much appreciated. Grazie. Grazie and ciao. to all of you. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Iyi akşamlar herkese. Teşekkürler. Iyi akşamlar herkese. Iyi akşamlar.